You're listening to Speak Your Peace, a podcast about social determinants of health. I am your host, Dr. Damien Kelly. Good afternoon. I'm Pastor E.A. Decker, the Greenhouse International Church, located right in the heart of Greens Point, Texas. So we have worked together off and on on a few projects with our H-Town chat and holding forums and, you know, uh, things about feedback when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. It's a bit of pleasure working with you in these spaces. And the times we've spoken, I don't think I've ever asked how you became a pastor, how you got to this position. Can you scrap some of that for us? You know, what barriers took place? How did you get to be the person you are today? Well, well yes, I definitely would love to uh, go back and explain it. First, let me say, it has always been a pleasure. Every time we engage in conversation, I enjoy <laughs> speaking with you because awesome. you, you talk from a different perspective. I, I, I love the way the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. And every conversation I've had with you has been a sharpening conversation. So I appreciate you, my brother. Oh, wow. So me personally, I, 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 and this may sound over-spiritual, but I think I was actually created out of my mother's womb to do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a coincidence that I'm here at this moment. I think that God divinely had a purpose for my life. My parents were teenagers, unwed teenagers, in the heart of Fifth Ward when I was born. And my grandparents raised me. And that dynamic caused me to grow up in a very strict church environment where most of my formative days were spent in church. Mm-hmm. Literally, I'm, I'm talking about literally in, in church. And I began to work around the church uh, as a kid. I'll never forget, even around 12 years old, in a Baptist church, a little kid was teaching the adult men's Sunday school class. Mm-hmm. It's just like the Bible was like my second language. I just... I fell in love with it, but it was also traumatic also because, again, my parents didn't raise me. And I have three younger brothers who were raised by my parents. My parents eventually got married and had three other sons. So on Sunday, imagine this dynamic. I'm at church every Sunday with my three brothers and my mother and my grandparents. At the end of church service, my brothers get in the car with my parents and drive to the suburbs. Mm-hmm. I get in the car with my grandparents and drive back to, quote, unquote, the hood. So it was like this separation disorder every Sunday and but that what that did was that made me come I won't say a loner but I learned how to live within myself so fast forward today there are sometimes some controversial issues or some issues that I can go with the masses or I can stand on what I firmly believe in Mm -hmm. and I can stand sometimes alone because Growing up, I grew up alone, mm-hmm. so I'm not afraid of losing a crowd. Yeah. So it gave me this kind of sense of just be you. And then, I'll never forget, I mean, it's, it's, it's so funny when you look back over your life. In elementary school, I'm in my front yard playing with my dog, and my dog runs out in the street, gets hit by a car. And the car doesn't stop, the car keeps going. I go in the house, crying like any kid would, but I sit at my grandparents' kitchen table and write a letter to the mayor. Mm. And I ask the mayor to pass a law that if a grown person or adult hits a kid's dog, they have to stop and render aid. I have no idea where the phrase <laughs> render aid came from. Okay. And today, of course, I know what it means today. Yeah, yeah. But in elementary school, I have no idea how I was introduced to that phrase. And I literally wrote this letter to the mayor. And two days later, the mayor of Houston, and I think it was Channel 13, shows up to my elementary school to interview me. Mm-hmm. So now, you know, again, fast forward. When there was a social issue, I'm on the news all the time. So it's like God preparing me mm-hmm. for these stages. I, I transferred in high school, my senior year, from one school to another. And uh, I knew I would get a football scholarship. And there were some things going on at my current school with me and one of the coaches. So I decided to transfer myself. And then I was ruled ineligible. And I was a kid mm-hmm. that in 1983 challenged the UIL. Hmm. on the transfer rule okay and I represented myself no attorney and they made a decision that I had to do an appeal before all the principals and the principals would make a decision on if I would be eligible to play my senior year of high school football I went against the principals and I got the victory which ended up changing the transfer rule in the state of Texas so 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 now I'm, I'm deeply involved in the political arena and, and helping you know 
get my opinion on certain law. So God was preparing me my whole journey. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it back then. Yeah, yeah. You know, back then it was more of a burden. Back then it was more of a I'm the negative. Mm -hmm. Not being raised by parents, a negative, but God turned to a positive. Mm -hmm. My dog getting hit, a negative, but God turned to a positive. Being root and eligible my senior year in high school football, but God turned to a positive. So every negative in my life was a stepping stone preparing me for this journey that I would never give for anything. I always said that I knew as a kid that I would work on Sundays. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, in the NFL, covering receivers and returning punts, but mm -hmm. I work every Sunday. Every Sunday, there you go. <laughs> I, work every, I work every Sunday. Yours is year round. God had, God had a divine Six, plan, yeah. and I'm, I'm grateful to that. Nice, I, I love that. So, well, as a proud Texan who did play high school football badly, but I did play, thank you so much for changing the eligibility <laughs> rules. Uh, as well as, you know, when you hit on something, when you talked about being alone earlier in your life, and I am in my 40s, Gen X, I, am a, I was a latchkey kid, both my parents worked, had to keep the house so I would go home. I have an older brother, but he's seven years older, and so I was alone a lot. One, I do connect on the, I don't necessarily need to be in a crowd of people mm -hmm. to be content. But also, I think what people miss out from that time when you are by yourself is you can sit and think about any issue thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And look at it from multiple points and really roll it around in your brain before you're ready to speak on it. Yes, I think sometimes when I talk to people, they have an instant reaction to something, but they haven't had enough time to actually process what they're thinking and think about the implication implications excuse me going forward so their their thoughts aren't fully cohesive but i mean your biblical man christ spent time alone in the desert a lot of characters in the bible spent time alone they had to detach mm -hmm. themselves from certain places even when it's you know moses my mom my mom's back to preacher so <laughs> i was ready to church also. Tell, <laughs> these are always threatening conversations whenever i engage and come even just uh spontaneous conversation between us somehow you will spark this intellectual paralysis and just make me think differently make me think from different perspectives so well, i really I'll, enjoyed that oh well, thank you yeah so uh dude i i really enjoy these conversations also pastor as well you know uh, i was raised in the church myself and you know stories of moses going to the mountain he went to the uh, mountain by himself mm -hmm. had time with god and he came down with those rules he had time to be alone christ in the desert etc connect that with job and he lost it he was mm -hmm. alone in that struggle I think people take for granted or try to rebel against alone time mm -hmm. and being in that space and being able to sit in that space and, and really just have peace or just think about things and strategize next moves, etc. So, But I also believe those spaces should be temporary too. Yes. So I talked about being alone and how I turned it, or how not me, but how God turned to a strength. Yes, sir. But the Bible also says it's not good for man to be alone. Mm -hmm. So it also... Being alone as a kid also distorted my ability to handle relationships. Mm. So I'm I, I was I'm quick to walk away from something mm. instead of always fighting for something relationship wise because I'm conditioned to being alone and I put these walls up. I'm I'm very transparent at this stage of my life, so I put these walls up that and, and, and now I know better. But back as a kid, the devil played tricks with me that my parents didn't love me mm -hmm. because they loved me, they would have raised me. But I realized they loved me so much, they allowed my grandparents to raise me in an environment to cultivate this gift God gave me. Mm -hmm. So so I put this wall around me saying, well, if my parents didn't love me, I'm not going to let anybody in this world ever hurt me or make me cry. Mm -hmm. So I put a, a shield around me. But it also stopped me from engaging into real relationships. Yeah. You know, When I think about you know life, if I had to pick you know a pack of friends, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have any because I, I was blessed intellectually as well as academically. I mean, uh, athletically. So they would ship me off to Vanguard schools. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in, in the hood, but I'd go to school across town. And then I get to school across town. I'll be upstairs in a Vanguard program playing football with the kids downstairs that I didn't grow up with. Mm -hmm. So I'll be shipped off early in the morning on the other side of town, leave that side of town late at night so I didn't engage in relationships in my neighborhood because when I go to school, everybody sleep. When I get back home, it's dark. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm not... At school, I'm at church mm -hmm. in a different community. So I was I was like a military kid without the military. I, got I was all over the place, so there was no real strong relationships. Now, the plus to that is, again, I don't need a crowd mm -hmm. to do what I feel is best. But then I also have, I don't have that. That's why I so enjoy a conversation like with you because it allows me to have a dialogue with somebody 
and, and and without just it being business. Yes, sir. So we need relationships. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. We need relationships. Uh, I thank God for my family structure today. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for the men that I do now have in my inner circle I can talk to and engage with. So we have that balance. Mm -hmm. Because again, without that balance, if I'm having a bad thought or bad idea, if I don't have someone to bounce it off of, then I may react and respond to that bad idea mm -hmm. and then follow down the road like, oh, I messed up. Well, because you didn't have anybody to. Every man needs a, a friend walking on the side of him, needs someone in front of him they can glean from, and needs someone behind them that they can pull back into. Mm -hmm. That That's a, a real healthy kind of lifestyle. And a lot of us don't have that. You know, A lot of us become long rangers. Yeah. Or either or we so depend on other people that we become parakeets just whatever the crowd say we say gotcha you know or, or we become enablers what we you know but that balance is you sharpen me someone else is sharpening us mm -hmm. and then we sharpen somebody behind us to keep like that, that thing going you know so so it's it's so for a while i was thinking when, when you were speaking i was like you know i think maybe this pastor and i are just the two signs of the same coins because you didn't have you may not had super close relationships with other people growing up, but you have a very solid relationship with your wife. Every time I talk to you, you mention her, uh, you mention her often. I have great relationships with people, but I'm divorced. <laughs> I can't sustain that part of my life. But I have great friends I can lean on and stuff. I, I love that aspect of it. You Again, know, being super transparent. No, I'm so transparent as well. Where I am today, yeah. I haven't always been here. Yeah. So, so understand, I've been married now, we've been married 27 years. God bless you. But before my marriage to my wife, mm -hmm. I was very dysfunctional relationships. Mm -hmm. Because the first disagreement, the first argument, mm -hmm. I was I was gone. I was ghost. Because yeah. I didn't have the temperament mm -hmm. to cultivate relationships when it became difficult. Because understand, my grandparents spoiled me. Mm -hmm. Coaches spoiled me. The church spoiled me. So if it wasn't my way, then I would just burn off. Yeah. But... Being married 27 years and having kids now and grandkids, I had to learn how to cultivate and develop real, lasting relationships yeah. through the good and the bad times. Yeah, I can't just go ghost on my family. Yeah, you know. So with me, I think my issue is like I'm with you. I'm one of those ride or die type people, but I'm not one of those that do off and on relationships with people. If we're broken up, we're broken up. I don't go backward. Trust for me, that's why it's so sacred, I think, mm -hmm. that it is so hard to gain, but it's so easy to lose. And anything could have you lose trust in a person, either ability, not just relationship wise, but even if you're working with a coworker and you know, you're know you trusting this person to get projects done and they're not getting done, there's a natural response for you not to keep trusting this coworker the same way. So I think that happens a lot in life. I totally get it. It's like we almost, I totally agree. Uh, and again, that strengths and weaknesses in that in that scenario. Mm. I have taken on the approach that I can just do it. Yeah. Well, again, that's not healthy. Yeah. Because <laughs> it, it, even in my current assignment, there are days where I give you an example. It's just last year, I worked three hundred sixty-five days with no days off. Yes, sir. I literally spend every day at work. Mm. I'm talking about Thanksgiving, Christmas, Christmas Eve, kids' birthdays. Wedding anniversaries, I, I still did the celebrations, but the celebration came after I went to work first. Mm -hmm. I had it. So this year, I strategically said, I'm going to plan and take time off no yes. matter what. Because if the world ends, it just ends. But I'm gonna end, it's going to end with me being with my family and not at work. Yeah. So, but that, that mindset of, well, sometimes it's going to be difficult. We take on a God complex. Mm -hmm. People like you, mean like you and I. That, well, no one can do it as well as we can, so we'll just do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, if that was true, then we'd be God. So I, I'm learning now how to give away part of my assignment. And if they don't do it the way I would do it exactly, doesn't mean they're not doing it as well. Just not doing it the way I would do it. So I have to now trust people to reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. Just like I'm able to navigate through. I got to trust other people to navigate through. And it's difficult for someone like you and I because our level of trust yeah, it's just minimal. Yeah, you know? and I hate hacks for help. I would much rather just do it myself. <laughs> but I'm working past it. I'm working. That's the same thing. I'm a work in progress. Also, yeah. I have not arrived. Don't get it wrong. Don't get it quick. I have not arrived. Uh, you know. So speaking of work, I know when when we get together, we are always getting together. It's almost on a sour note because so many different things are happening in this community. We are here in Greens Point, Houston, Texas, and. As a pastor of this church, you know, you are called to 
I may almost be here constantly because of what's happening in this neighborhood. What's happening, struggling with maybe the crime, the... What's really, I guess, from your vantage point, impacting your role as pastor here when it comes to all the different things happening in Greens Point right now? Well, that's a long, long, long answer. So I'll start first with opportunities. Yes, sir. I, I believe that one of my primary goals right now, one of my primary assignments, missions, is to create opportunities that I call doing good in the hood to make sure that the little guy on the street corner has the same opportunity before him as the kid in the suburbs, mm. as the kid that grows up in a affluential community. I want the kids in this community to have the same opportunity. Now, what you do with those opportunities is up to you, but at least allow me an opportunity to do better. Mm -hmm. And then I need to create mentors that can show the next generation the doors of opportunity and how to get to this table that we all seek to get to, but someone got to teach me how to get to that table. So if we teach the kids and create opportunities, we will see that any community can be transformed and turned around. And even though we talk about this particular community often, and many tend to put a negative light on it, I'm, I'm glad mm. that God called me to this community because over the last seven years, we've seen drastic, I mean, drastic improvement in, in crime, in opportunity, in, in community awareness. This community is much better today than most people want to give it credit for. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I'm not comparing you know, bad with bad, but I would say, I'm just using the example because they both start with G. Greens Point and a Galleria, mm -hmm. if you put the real data on the table mm -hmm. and take the name off and look at the data, you would be amazed how much Greens Point rates higher in security, higher in different economic advances hmm. in the Galleria. Mm -hmm. If you, you strip away the, the word Galleria or Greens yeah. Point, just put the... Just look the raw data. You'd be like, okay, you'd be confused. Mm -hmm. But the media and the narrative is Greens Point bad, other mm -hmm. places is good. Well, that's not correct today. That's mm -hmm. old news. It's not the current news. And I think a lot of that has to do with creating, and it's going to sound strange, relationships. Now, a, a man who struggles in relationships mm -hmm. has used relationships in this community to make the community better. Mm -hmm. uh, relationships with law enforcement, relationship with the business community, relationships with individuals that you would say would be outside the border, uh, bloods, crips, gang members, mm -hmm. people that you would call bad people, but create relationships that show them a better way. We even have created relationships with apartment owners and residents. Okay, They're, they're actually communicating, talking, where it's not finger pointing, mm -hmm. but we're holding hands. I'm not saying we're having a kumbaya every week, but I'm saying yeah. we've learned how to come together and realize we, are, we, are, we have more in common mm -hmm. than uncommon. And let's just create relationships and talk. No, I, I love that idea. I One of the, my careers when I was working at the Houston Housing Authority, and it, it would amaze me how so many people wouldn't haven't spoken to their landlord until they got to court that day. Mm -hmm. Now it's the first time they had a conversation. And I would tell them that so much of this can be handled outside of these court walls before it even got to this point. So when you're working and engaging with law enforcement and you know local neighborhood people who are maybe doing things and you know different gangs etc having those conversations building those those relationships is, is strategic it's beneficial to i think everyone involved one of the times i think we spoke i think the last time we spoke actually you talked about not just this neighborhood but just i think in lower socioeconomic classes the no snitching policy and how that I guess complicates your role as a pastor, or maybe it helps your role as a pastor because people will come to you and talk about certain things that are happening, and without fear of some sort of you know retribution or something like that. Or, yeah, I, I I say that no snitching, and you can call it law code or mm -hmm. whatever you want to reference that is one of the most dangerous things that ever happened to our communities because what it does it empowers the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it makes doing the right thing a negative. I work in, in this community, I spend most of my time in this community, but the community that I'm blessed now to raise my family in, we have homeowners, society, we have, if, if you park a car on the street in my neighborhood and it's still too long, you're gonna get a note. Mm -hmm. And that, that note, if it's not addressed, that car be towed. <laughs> you know, that's that certain standards. That, that, that's certain. I have the same in my neighborhood also. You know, so, 
why shouldn't that apply in the hood? Mm-hmm. Pookie shouldn't be able to openly commit crimes mm-hmm. and no one says, Pookie, you're wrong. Well, because we put these codes up of no snitching. Well, snitching really goes back to a criminal environment. If you and I are engaged in, in illegal activity and the police come and we would take off running and, and I'm a little faster, you know, I get away and you get caught. Mm-hmm. Well, the no snitching meant that you wouldn't tell. Mm-hmm. Who was involved in this crime with you? You mm-hmm. just take the case. Mm-hmm. That's what they don't stitch it. But now we've allowed that criminal code to become a community code. Yeah. And, and which is really out of order. If if you are hurting Miss Johnny, if you are violating the community, you should be off the streets, off community. We should be protectors. It's not snitching. It's mm-hmm. protecting. It, it's empowering. It's because I want the next generation to be better than me. Mm-hmm. And if I'm creating an atmosphere where the bad guys could be bad guys, then what hope am I giving the next generation? Mm-hmm. So one of the things that, that I, I'm aggressively working on is, you know how the people say they want to uh, defund police? Mm-hmm. I want to defund no snitching. <laughs> I want to take the power away from the no snitching yeah. code where people feel proud mm-hmm. to get bad guys off the street mm-hmm. where it's not taboo. Uh, where it's, I know he did it and we're going to stand together and get him off the street so he won't do it to someone else. I want to empower our community to take our communities back. I think, I want to say this, I guess there is, for a while there's been no positive when it comes to talking about an issue that someone did in the neighborhood. I mean, coming forward to law enforcement for, for the longest time, law enforcement, positive reinforcement, that's, um, it was escaping me. Pos- there's no positive reinforcement for that because for the longest time, I don't think the police would actually protect witnesses and protect people who mm-hmm. came forward so yes i would tell on pookie but at the end of the day i have to go right back to that neighborhood and pookie's relatives pookie's boys who all saw me testify in court now i'm back on uh, in my apartment or what have you and now there's a target on my back so i guess out of fear for my safety and our family safety people kind of keep their mouth shut but that, that's because we have empowered the, the darkness. Mm-hmm. So I'll give two analogies. And, and back during times of slavery, I often wondered, you know, maybe a little naive, but why did, because there were always more slaves on the plantation than slave owners mm-hmm. and their families. Why wouldn't the slaves just, in the middle of the night, take over the house? That would be a couple times. You know, so, so but, but if it became the norm, guess what? Slavery mm-hmm. ended a long time mm-hmm. quicker. If, if the slaves were said, even at the risk of losing my life, mm-hmm. we're going to fight every doggone day mm-hmm. until we take this house. Then there will be coming on less and less plantations. Mm-hmm. So that same analogy, uh, my grandfather, when I was growing up, there's no way on earth he would have allowed a crack house to be next to his house. Gotcha. Even, even if the crack dealer may have had a gun or, or, or army, he would have risked his life mm-hmm. to protect his family. So what happened to those moral codes where we protect our communities so yes if if if, if Pookie commits a crime and I, I turn Pookie in and Pookie group come back and get me that's one thing but if Pookie group come back and get me and I'm standing with the community mm-hmm. then now Pookie's group loses its power because it's not about me it's about the community the community stands up and says no mm-hmm. not just one individual yeah. but communities so we need more community engagement more community empowerment so people won't feel isolated mm-hmm. and alone. And it shouldn't take a Crime Stoppers uh, donation to get you to say something. You should say something because you want to empower your doggone community. Yeah. So with the work you're doing, how do you, I guess, build that sense of community back in these neighborhoods? Because I guess right now it, it feels somewhat fragmented. It starts with trust. And trust is not something you talk about. Some Trust something you do. Mm-hmm. So I often say that at this particular church, we don't just talk about it. We be about it, and that's a little ironic. But what that means is that we're always involved and engaged in everything, not mm-hmm. just inside these four walls, not just quote unquote church stuff. We involved in people stuff. Mm-hmm. Whenever there's an issue, we're there. When there's a need, we're there. A crisis, we're there. Whenever there's any kind of thing that's good or bad, you're gonna find us there. So when we need it, we can be there. What the community hates is people who show up only when the cameras show up. Mm. Like politicians during election season, their church attendance is very high during election season. Mm-hmm. But where are you doing non-election seasons? Who are you helping then? 
where the turkeys when you're not running for campaign? Where where the where the donations and, and the love and the kissing the babies when you're not running for office? And and so community need to see people that's trustworthy and you're trustworthy by being visible at all times. I, I lost a lot of friends with this statement. Oh boy. Uh, during Hurricane Harvey, I think it was CNN came because uh, we were we were doing a lot of work, open a uh, great did hours, and I made the statement that to me, if a pastor can take an offering up on Sunday morning and not offer himself on Monday, then he's just a modern day con artist. Can you elaborate? What do you mean? So, on Sunday, I ask people to come to church, mm -hmm. and every church we're going to take an offering. Meaning we're going to receive money. Well, on Monday, what are we doing with that Monday? With that money? Mm. Is it going back to empower the community? Or is it going so I give you a new suit, new pair of shoes, and a new car? I've said that same thing. I'm like, why are you paying your time so the pastor's rims can stay shiny? Yeah. So 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 on Monday, we don't take off. Yeah. On Monday at ten o'clock we open up a food pantry. Yes. And people come to get and receive. We we offer clothes and jobs and we offer the community what they need in the physical realm. We inspire them spiritually on Sunday. And then we offer all their physical needs, mental needs, emotional needs, Monday through Friday. So we can't just receive an offering without offering ourselves. Can you elaborate? What are some of those needs you're seeing in the community? Oh, man. So this community, like any other community, uh, right now, I say the top three, uh, and I've been asked this question a great deal lately, the top three opportunities, which means jobs, mm -hmm. and, and not just a minimum wage job. Yeah, not just fast food. Because my wife and I was having this conversation literally just yesterday. And the average apartment rent now mm -hmm. is about twelve hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. If you have a child with child care, apartment rent, and you're making fifteen dollars an hour, you know, you can't even afford to live. Because mm -hmm. once you get paid it's already gone. Yes sir. So you start out in debt. You you're making fifteen dollars an hour, you're working forty hours a week and your rent and your child care has already consumed your check. So what are you gonna eat? How are you gonna get to work? Mm -hmm. How are you gonna put clothes on your kids' back? You, you're in a hole. So one is opportunities, financial opportunities. Secondly, a lot of communities are what's called now food deserts. Mm -hmm. What's there is overpriced, mm -hmm. unhealthy. So kids grow up in environments where they don't really have an opportunity to get fruit, vegetables, and things they need to really prosper and to grow so their mind can be sharp. And then just we, we have to, in this community, in every community, we, we have to restore neighborhood. Not hoods, mm -hmm. but neighborhoods where it has value, where it has meaning, where it has purpose. Growing up, even though I grew up in Field Ford, all the neighbors knew one another. And, he, and, and as, as I'm catching a bus for school early in the morning, coming back home from school late at night, if I picked a rock up and do it, and at someone's car, by the time I got home, my grandparents would know, mm -hmm. and the next house or two, Mr. Smith or Miss Jones would come out and say, boy, you know better than that. Mm -hmm. And my grandparents wouldn't call him and cuss them out. Hmm. My grandparents would call and say, thank you. Mm -hmm. When that boy get here, we got something for him. Oh, yeah. But now that, that, that community involvement and engagement is now gone. Mm -hmm. No one talks to each other. And if you do happen to tell someone's kid right from wrong, they want to fight. Yeah. They want to curse instead of saying thank you for helping me be a part of the village. Mm -hmm. Now we at combat. So, Pastor, I'm an idea man. I got a phrase for you. You can use this, keep this. Okay. So, when you said the neighborhood, I thought to myself, put the neighbor back with the hood. Oh, I love it. So, instead of people saying, I'm in the hood, say, no, no, add neighbor to that because you and I are neighbors. Did you copyright that? That's yours. Yeah. Keep that. That is yours. <laughs> that is, I'm See, an idea that's guy. what I'm saying, brother. Man. <laughs> Every time we talk, mm -hmm. I'm always going to write something down because you're going to say something going to spark my curiosity and expand on it. That's yours, sir. Put so, the neighbor back in the hood. Neighborhood. This is yeah, what this is. I love it. I love it. So we've talked. I know uh, I've joked with you some about... Oh, I, before I go to this next point, when you said point number one, I think it was point number one about bringing back opportunities mm -hmm. to the neighborhoods. Have you seen that trend and it's happening in other major cities because of like people running into stores and stealing? They're closing so many different stores in different San Francisco, Chicago, New York. I believe actually some are going to get closed here in Houston as well. Has Have you seen that trend happen more in Houston also? Has it impacted you guys at all? That particular uh, scene I've seen on social media over and over again but I have not seen it locally. 
Good. I, I, and, and again, it's good. I have not seen it locally. And again, Texas is kind of different too, though. You know, mm-hmm. most most stores in Texas are packing. <laughs> 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 I know, this, this this funny but not funny. I saw the one video, the store the store clerks. Mm-hmm. They put their hands on that dude. He was going stealing beer or something, like cigarettes. He was he was okay. And boy, they they gave him old fashioned old out. testament. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you, you're less likely to run into a store in Texas mm-hmm. and get away with that than you would California or somewhere else. That's a good point. That's, that's truth in that. So kind of going to my next point, and I know I joke with you sometimes about when you're going to run for office. So you And you hinted on this earlier as well. We're in election cycle. By the time this podcast airs, the mayoral race will be done, things like that, kind of all shaken out. From your vantage point, what do you think needs to happen either policy, political agenda, what have you, to curb some of the issues your community is facing? I am very politically engaged with the process and the politicians. I was just, it's so amazing. I was just having this conversation earlier today. I would love to, and it may be impossible, the Bible says the poor will be with you always, and we know there's going to be some negative in everything. I would love for a day where politicians will put the people ahead of the politics. Put the needs of the people ahead of the politics. Okay. And what I mean by that is, let's pass laws that make sense. Let's not always fight over Democrat and Republican, but let's put the agenda for the people. What's best for the people? Is there a certain policy or law you're looking at specifically that that can kind of elaborate this point? Well, just in general. So, some sometimes things just don't make sense. Like even. Though, Instead of Texas the gun, we were joking earlier about how aggressive Texans are. I don't believe everybody should be walking around with a gun. I okay. don't because understand something in today's culture, mm-hmm. mental illness mm-hmm. is high, drug abuse is high. Yes, sir. So if you have not committed a felony, you're able to walk around the streets of Houston mm-hmm. with a gun, like the Wild Wild West. <laughs> and if I'm not mentally stable, mm-hmm. I'm going to overreact. Yeah. So someone has just lost their life. Because you empowered me with a gun. So I, that should be a, a series of qualifications mm. to carry a gun. Just like you have to take a driving test. Yes, sir. I believe you should have to take a, a major test. Well, they did. And, and they just, you don't have to do it anymore. But you don't do it anymore, you know. yeah. so, so now that, that, so that law is kind of like, you know, what's common? That's not common sense, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and there are other laws that just, when you think about it, just don't make too much sense. Mm. Just put to make sure that everyone has it. An opportunity to get a education, mm-hmm. an opportunity to get a job, fair housing, mm-hmm. affordable fair housing. Yes, sir. Child care. Because even if I had a job in the house, I can't go to work because I can't afford to leave my child. Mm-hmm. So let's make things where people can actually live without this burden of debt. You know, think about it. Even, even, and and we're, we're both educated, so it costs a lot of money to go to college. My student loans are due this month. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so you go to college, you pay all this money, then you work a job to pay back the debt for going to college, and then you're old. Mm-hmm. And, and then your family paying for a funeral to bury you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so where, where's the life in that? Mm-hmm. Let's make living worth living. And let's, let's stop some of the things we do that just don't make sense. Mm-hmm. So you and I spoke earlier offline And I kind of mentioned in passing that, you know, there are other organizations, specifically universities, like I mentioned Houston Baptist, now it's Houston Christian University. And I mentioned them because that's one of the places I got one of my degrees from. I also got my doctorate from St. Thomas University. There are other religious, faith-based organizations out there. How can some of those faith-based either schools, organizations, what have you, better support what you guys are doing here at Greenhouse? Again, the Bible says you have not because you ask not, and my people perish for lack of knowledge. So that's on that's more on, on us of exposing what we're doing, mm. and once we expose what we're doing, then the resources and the partnerships come. Well, again, one of my weaknesses is asking for help. Is it going to be very funny? The first time I received a a grant or some a donation from someone outside the church. Mm. I almost I, I said first I can't accept this I thought it was like some political bribe or something you know <laughs> I'm, no I can't, I can't accept that That's, you get bad time for that <laughs> and, and they laughed at me because mm. I was unaware 
of the grant process mm -hmm. and the nonprofit, you know, donations, you know. And so, but once I started getting educated in that, I realized no man's an island, yeah. and I need help to do this. And the more help I have to do this, the more people I can help. Mm -hmm. So, so now we are open to receive donations from the outside. We're, we're creating more partnerships because again, we're stronger together than we are apart. So, if you desire, just you know, it's it's clear God's blessed us. We're very visible. So, what we're doing is very visible. If anything we're doing, you know, reach your your heartstrings, and you want to be a part partner with us, a uh, uh, send a donation or help us in any shape, form, or fashion. We pray this crazy prayer every Monday. And we have to go to put stuff in our hands, put in the hands of others. So now as we hold more hands and create more partnerships, we're able to do more for more people. So we welcome you to partner with us, to sow into us, and just help us help other people. Last question for me, and I was kind of closing some of the notes out. When we speak often, we speak about the loss of life that has been happening in communities, not just this community, but you know, in Houston in general. We have a lot of super younger African American males who are getting caught up in the system, in certain things happening on the streets. Last we also talked, we talked about that zombie drug that's happening in, in youth. Uh, there, you have people in certain parks that are taken who are homeless and they're literally just frozen. Cops thought they were dead, but they're not. I know, I know it takes it takes a toll on me because I've worked in social services for so many years. How is it taking a toll on you? How is that impacting your community's health? Well, drugs, period. Uh, because drugs have a negative impact. So, of course, it affects the community negatively because drug damages people, it damages relationships, it damages trust. So, drugs in every shape, form, and fashion are negative. And whenever there's negatives that's dominating, that those places become negative. So we have to create again more opportunities, but people do not feel that a drug is an escape to their reality. But let's recreate a, rea a new reality. So if if I mental health in our communities definitely has to be pushed instead of just saying Pookie crazy, <laughs> let's, let's provide help for Pookie. I Seriously, let, let, yeah, let's offer like something other than appeal. Or something to smoke or something to drink. Let's create an alternative. They're like no snitching. We need to overcome that. We need to overcome the stigma of mental health in our communities. Mm. And then once we do that, deal with the mental health and the drugs and the family structure, it goes back to self-identity. And I'm not bragging, but I've never been high in my life. Mm. But I've always known who I was. Yes, sir. So I don't need to escape. I just deal with the realities, good or bad. I deal with them and, and figure out a way how to overcome them. Uh, so, because if you get high, that means you're gonna get low. Mm. You're gonna come back down to the high. Yes, sir. You know. So let's figure out how to help people navigate through the difficulties of life without having to depend on a substance. And once we start doing that, then we see how to overcome stuff. Because stuff's gonna happen. And then for me personally, because you asked the question, how do I uh, keep going in the midst of all this? Man, I'm so blessed. I have some grandkids. Mm. And. They're my, they're my escape. They're my, they're my drug because, and I'm, I'm blessed to be around them all the time, so I can go and be goofy paw paw with them, <laughs> and so I could, I could just have like this past weekend, unfortunately, uh, another murder, uh, funeral. Church was packed with young people and men to pour my soul out, and when I left, I get to go home and watch Disney with my grandbaby, yeah, and laugh and joke and uh, just have fun to escape the reality of this world. So that's my outlet. God bless me with grandkids as my outlet to stay sane in this insane world. You know, so I love that. Pastor Dagger, if people want to reach out to you, how do they get in contact with you? Greenhouse International Church, located two hundred West Greens Road, Houston, Texas, seven seven zero six seven. Church phone number two eight one two oh nine nine three three nine. Website www.ghic.net. We're on all your social media platforms. Facebook, Instagram, Greenhouse International Church. Come by anytime. We would love to see you, partner with you, or even assist you. We say this is the place you go to grow to reach your full potential. Thanks for listening to our latest episode. If you like the content and want to help us grow, do me a favor. Like, share, and subscribe to the Health RCMI channel. Also, tell a friend. Special thanks to our producer, Allison Nedley. And as always, our fearless leader, Dr. Esmenario Bossi. I am your host, Dr. Damien Kelly, leaving you with one simple message. Do good things.